It is my joy to welcome you to today's podcast. Our prayer is that the Lord will minister to you in a special way during our time together. Praise the Lord. I thank my Lord for this privilege of sharing the word with you this morning. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your precious presence amidst us. And we know, Father, that there are folks in our families who are suffering. Families who have lost their dear ones in death. People who are in hospitals. This morning, Spirit of God, we pray that you will console and comfort those who are bereaved. Father, we pray, Jehovah Rapha, send your healing to those who are on hospital beds and suffering in their homes with various kinds of diseases. This morning, Lord, we trust you for healing. Quicken everybody, Lord, by your spirit. And Father, this morning, I want your grace. I hide myself behind the cross. I take the blood of Jesus, Lord, this morning. I pray that your spirit will grant me utterance to speak your word. Anoint my lips, Holy Spirit, I pray this morning. And everyone who is listening, whether in this church or wherever they are online, Father, I pray a blessing upon them and pray that you will anoint their ears and their hearts that they might listen, they might obey. Holy Spirit, we believe you this morning to transform lives. That's our desire. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. As you can see, the topic of my message this morning is living through turbulent times. Living through turbulent times. And I want to base my message on the scripture passage, 1 Peter chapter 1. In verse 6, we read like this. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you may have had suffering, suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And in the other passage on the backdrop, we read that your God will stabilize you. He will strengthen you. He will confirm you after you have suffered for a little while. You know, who in the wildest imagination could see that a dreadful malady which people have never known in their lives, which never happened in the history of the world ever, would strike the whole world in the form of COVID-19. March 2020, life took a drastic turn for every human being that lives on the face of the earth. A pandemic that threatens the very fabric of life. It affected every area of life for every human being. And people were forced to stay at home. They are in a lockdown. In fact, a virtual house arrest. Travelers were standard all over the world because no modes of transport was available. Businesses came to a standstill. Markets, educational institutions closed down. Earlier people were busy eating, drinking, working, having entertainment, enjoying their lives. But suddenly everything came to a standstill. 
holidaying and entertaining stopped. No more going to Goa and Kulu Manali. No late night parties, no late night movies. Before money could determine everything. But today money has no value. And today the economy has taken a nose dive. As any other form of life, religious life also got affected. Churches were forced to close down. You know the Lord's word, two or three gathered in my name. That became very meaningful. Marriages are no more a show of pomp and extravagance. Even funerals have changed. The other day, one of my Christian friends, she told me their dear relative died. Only their daughter was allowed to go and see the dead body. They took the dead body away. And they really don't know whether it was burnt, cremated, or buried. A very sad state of affairs. It's not business as usual. And the world is not anymore the same. Perhaps will not be the same anymore. And we are asking the question, when are things going to be normal? Do you really want to go back to the pre-COVID days? Where they the best days? Of course, I want this COVID dispensation to end. But I really want a different kind of days, not the pre-COVID days. I believe people have learned their lessons. I think all of us need to do a rebooting of our lives. We need to have new priorities. And it became suddenly a heyday for the so-called prophets and doomsayers. All kinds of conflicting and confusing prophecies and theories. You know the number of WhatsApp messages I received even from my Caleb friends, please watch this. Please watch this prophecy. Some of them said, the world is going to end with COVID. You know, in the beginning of, I think, the 20th century, there was a man, a church of South India pastor called Justice Joseph. In Malayalam and Tamil, we called him Vidwan Kuti. He prophesied that Jesus is going to come back in five and a half years. So the day came. They all assembled together in their homes, ready to receive. Those who were farmers, they removed all their, all their produce. And in the last days, two or three days, they began to consume and eat everything because the Lord is coming back. But the Lord did not come back. May I plead with you, dear friends, for God's sake, don't run after these prophets and sadhus. Be rooted in the eternal word of God. What we need today is a divine discernment. There is so much junk that's available today. But we have an instruction manual in the form of the Bible. Everything needs to be filtered and checked. You know, for some people, everything is bad. They don't watch TV because there is bad news in the TV. There is filth in the TV. They don't use the Facebook because it is misused. They don't use WhatsApp because they think it's bad. 
You know, there are filters available. There are spam filters. There are antivirus programs. And during this time, many people think that God has taken a holiday and let the world to be governed by the devil. Do you believe that the devil is going to be triumphant? They think that God had an emergency meeting. He called his friends, his council of ministers, and said, friends, our program for the world, the project A has failed. So now we have to invent a project B. Do you think that God is a helpless spectator? My God has a purpose for the world. He doesn't leave it half done. He will finish it. He is still on the throne. He is mightier than the COVID. He is preparing a bride. And he is coming back for her. And he is at work in you, dear friends. He hasn't finished with you. May I ask you this morning, what's happening to you? There is no church, no fellowship, no care cell, no midweek fellowship. Are you experiencing a spiritual lockdown? Or even as you are shut out to the world, are you experiencing a shut in with the beloved Lord? My God is greater than COVID, let me repeat. I know that you are worried about your lost jobs, your sinking business, your shattered dreams. But may I assure you on the basis of God's word that all is not lost. COVID is not the end of the world. Cheer up. God can pick up the shattered and broken piece of your lives and create something very beautiful out of it. He is an expert, a specialist in mending broken lives. He is a master craftsman. He is working on your life. He will work on broken lives. There is hope. You know, there's a beautiful song that we used to sing in our younger days. With Christ in the vessel, we can smile at the storm, smile at the storm, smile at the storm. With Christ in the vessel, I can smile at the storm as we go sailing, sailing on. Yes, you can smile at the storm. We can smile. Dear friends, if you have lost your smile, I declare that your smile will come back this morning. You know what is a turbulence? A turbulence is a difficult period, you know. I remember once my wife and I, we were going for a conference in Holland. We landed in England and we had to take a very small plane which could take only 10 people from Heathrow Airport to Amsterdam Airport. We were there. And midway, above the ocean, there was a terrific turbulence. It's a very small plane. And the plane began to shake, going up and down, sideways, here and there. It was so difficult. We were all holding our breath thought this is the end of our lives. I even prayed a prayer, Lord, if I'm coming into your presence, <laughs> please take me home. We were ready to go. But then through the loudspeaker, the pilot assured us, don't be worried. This is nothing unusual. I see this every day. There has been much worse turbulences. Be assured that you will land safely in Amsterdam. 
Yes, we did. Living life through turbulent times. While the apostle Peter wrote this uh, letter, the church was going through a very turbulent time. They were being persecuted under the Roman regime, especially under the regime of Emperor Nero. He was a mad king. You might have heard about the, the great fire of Rome. The man behind the fire was Emperor Nero. But he began to blame the Christians for setting fire to the city. And they began to persecute them. All kinds of persecutions. People were massacred. People were cut by the swords. People were made like torches. And in Nero's garden, at night time, they put pitch or tar around the clothes that were bound around the people, the Christians. And they set fire to it. And the Christians were used as lights as their bodies were burning in Nero's garden. All kinds of persecutions. Very terrible. And Apostle Peter is writing to such a people to encourage them. He first reminds them of their position in Christ. And then he tells them about the divine re resources that are available to go through this storm. First of all, he tells them, verse 1, that you are a chosen people. You are a people who are elect. A very special people. Set apart for a special purpose. Chosen for a glorious future. See, God the Father has purchased a bride for his son. Giving a very heavy price. He purchased you and me paying the price of his son, the blood of his son, the very dry, last drop of it, the precious blood of the lamb. Yes, we were chosen at a great expense. A very high price was paid. He says you have an inheritance. There is an aspect of salvation which is yet to be revealed. It is much greater than your present life. The bridegroom will appear one day to take his prepared bride home with him, to be with him forever. As many of us know, there are three aspects of salvation. The past aspect of salvation is that we were saved from the penalty of sin through grace. That's the past. And today, the present aspect of salvation, we are being saved through grace by the power of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Being saved from the power of sin, that's the present. And then there is a glorious day coming, a future aspect of salvation, when we will be saved even from the very presence of sin. That is when the bridegroom will appear. 1 Peter 2 and 9, we read like this. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to the Lord, a people who are his own possession, one version says. Yes, we belong to the Lord. His own possession. Then Peter reminds them that they are strangers in the world. One version says that they are resident aliens. You are only a temporary resident. 
You don't have a PR. Remember, you have a green card, but you are a citizen of a different country, living temporarily in a foreign land. Peter reminds them that your citizenship is in heaven. This means that you are a different people. You are different from the people who live around you in the world. Your allegiance is to your homeland, which is heaven. You're not going to be here forever. This is only a temporary brief stint. Eternity is much greater than this present earthly life. And dear citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we have a king who is in charge. He is in control of everything. And he is interested in every aspect of your life. You and I are indeed very special to him. A very special possession. So Peter says, we need to have a different mindset. Dear friends, you don't have to believe everything that the people of the world say about the COVID. You don't have to gulp all that the news media blurts out every day, morning and evening throughout the day, 24-7. Peter says that trials are inevitable in the life of a Christian. Just because I'm a Christian believer, I'm not given immunity from trials. We're not exempted from trouble and persecution when they occur. I know that this outbreak of the COVID has caused undue misery to many Christian families. We know that many Christians and even pastors and evangelists have lost their lives. Thousands have lost their jobs and thousands have lost their livelihood. I know young folks in this, own church, in this church who have lost their jobs. and trying hard to make ends meet. But the word of God assures us this morning that our king is in full control of the situation. When the situation looks hopeless, Peter says, we have a living hope. Even in our suffering, which is at times very painful and hard to undertake, Christians can reap several benefits. Yes, suffering is beneficial. It makes us spiritually strong. Our faith becomes much stronger as we learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Thus we know that sometimes God allows trials in our lives that he might use the opportunity to enhance our spiritual growth and build our spiritual character and stamina. Peter says, during the trials, you have every reason to rejoice. It enhances our dependence upon the Lord. It helps us to overcome our weaknesses by trusting in the power of the Lord. It helps us to lean on him completely and trust him for our everyday healing, provisions, and to be joyful. You know, there is this old saying which says, sweet are the uses of adversity. And then in his epistle, Peter goes on to tell his people of the spiritual resources that are available as his chill, dear children. Let's focus upon some of these verses. As we already saw, Peter says, first of all, that the trials also are temporary. First Peter 1 Peter 1.6. Our time here on this earth is a very brief stint compared to the endless eternity which we will spend with our dear Lord. 
Paul says that our momentary light affliction is nothing and it produces in us an eternal weight of glory. Light affliction, weight of glory. Look at the play of words and the contrast. Trials are momentary, but salvation is eternal. You might be wondering, Peter says, a little while? He said, right? A little while? It's been six months now I've been under this lockdown. You say, a little while? Yes. It is just a little while. It is just a moment compared to the vast eternity which we are going to send with our master. And secondly, Peter reminds them that trials are necessary. You know, Psalm 119, verses 67 and 71. The psalmist says, I went astray before I was afflicted. It is good for me that I was afflicted. You see, the trials and hardships enable us to experience the power of God that is available. In fact, may I dare say that we certainly lack something in our spiritual lives unless we have had an opportunity to go through, pass through some kind of a trial. It is written about Jesus, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Hebrews 5, 8. May I read a few verses? Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God, Acts 14 and 22. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. And then Peter says, do not be surprised at the fiery trial among you, as though something strange things were happening to you, 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. And the Lord Jesus himself said, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, John 16 and verse 33. And Jesus, of course, is an ultimate example in suffering. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable, unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have, one, we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Then after this, Peter tells them about the purpose of suffering. First of all, Peter says, suffering refines us. Here Peter is comparing our faith with gold. He says, faith is more precious than gold. Gold is perishable, but faith isn't. Faith has eternal value, whereas gold is worthless in terms of eternity. Then he says, both gold and faith are refined by fire. The genuineness of our faith, the authenticity of our faith is tested by fire. Just like gold is tested by fire. You know, we have the parable of the sower where Jesus talks about the seed that fell into different kinds of soil. When he talks about the seed that fell 
among the rocky soil, it says, it sprouted up very fast. But when the sun came out, God dried up, God withered. Then Jesus explains that some received the word with joy, but affliction and persecution came. They fell away. Their faith was counterfeit. It was not genuine. Genuine faith grows strong during trials. James says in chapter 1 and verse 3 that the trial of our faith produces endurance or perseverance. During the refining process, all the impurity or the dross is removed. You know the goldsmith, the goldsmith melts the gold in fire and he removes, skims out all the impurity that comes on the surface. The dross is removed. It says, till he can see a reflection of his face in the melted the molten gold. Yes, trials refine us. We go through the fire, but Jesus transforms us until the image of Christ is formed in us. Sometimes God takes you through stuff just get rid of what is not pleasing to him. He takes you through stormy waters, not to drown you, but to bring you out of some harmful baggage that is causing problems in your spiritual life. He takes you through the fire, not to burn you, but that you might come, like, come out like pure gold, refined in the fire of affliction. You know, there is this beautiful song, you know. Some through the waters, some through the floods, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. I find it difficult to sing now. But friends, do you know that I used to sing? I used to sing in a choir. I used to sing in my seminary choir. It was a men's choir, you know. I used to sing what is called the second tenor in the men's choir arrangement. And you know why it was a men's choir? Because our seminary was a holiness seminary. We were not allowed to intermingle with the ladies. You know, Peter then talks about the resources that are available to deal with trials. First of all, as we already said, you are kept by the power of God. In verse 5, Peter says, we, we are shielded by God's power through faith. God's power protects and shields you until the day of Jesus. When we are weak, his power makes us strong and perfects us. Yes, our trials are an opportunity for us to demonstrate the power of God through our frail lives. God's mighty power operates in us to make us victorious in our trials. Ephesians 3.20 God's mighty power is operating in us. Jude chapter 20, Jude verse 24 says we are kept by the power of God. 
Then he is talking about grace and peace. You know, grace and peace was a normal greeting when the apostles wrote their letters to the churches. It meant a lot to the suffering Christians. What here Peter says, may grace and peace be multiplied. You've been saved and sanctified through grace. You have peace with God and you have peace within you. But let this grace and peace be multiplied so as to deal with the present crisis. You know, it has a reference to the ironic blessing. We had that beautiful song, you know, sung several times. The blessing. It's recorded in Numbers 6 and verse 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. And be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. And give you his peace. Both grace and peace are there. We know so much about grace and peace. I don't need to dwell on it. Someone said a simplest definition of grace is G-R-S-E-E, -E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's favor. We're not just saved by grace, but we need God's grace every step of the way, every day of our lives. We need an abundant supply of grace to face the difficult changes of the present crisis. We need grace to cross over the storms of life and to be victorious over the present trials. You know that beautiful song, Amazing Grace, it, that says it all. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yes, the saving grace. Then it says, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. It is grace that brought me this, thus far, and grace will lead me home. Yes, saving grace, sustaining grace, keeping grace, healing grace, providing grace, and grace that will see me to my eternal home. What a wonderful Savior we have. Precious, precious grace. Yes. Everything in our life, we owe it to the grace of God. And then Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9.8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you. May grace be multiplied to your everyday need. And when Paul talks about his physical infirmity, he says, I asked the Lord three times to free, from, to free me from this trial. But he told me, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Dear friends, may I ask you this morning, through the Spirit of God, make this grace available to you every moment of the day. Then he talks about peace. This again is an outcome of grace. The Hebrew word is shalom. No, it, it's a word, it's a very composite word that embraces all goodness and perfection. It involves perfect harmony, soundness of health, freedom from fear, anxiety, care, and worry. The perfect calm which is denoted by the phrase, peace, like a river. 
peace like a river. We know the story, that incident when Jesus was in the lake, in the boat with his disciples. The strong tempest and storm. The disciples were worried. They were crying out and they went to Jesus. Lord, don't you care that we perish? Jesus stood up. Don't you have faith? Then he stood up and said, to the wind and to the storm and to the raging sea, peace, be still. Peace, be still. His word has the power to still the storm. And he is with us today during our fiercest wind. Just as we sang, he is the Chatan. He is the rock in whose cleft I can hide myself during the storm. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide. Let me hide beside you. Let me hide in you. Peace is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. You see, so far the humans have not found, they haven't really understood what the COVID is. They don't have a solution. But in talking about the peace, Philippians 4, 7, the Paul reminds us that the peace of God transcends all human understanding. It guards our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He gives us his peace by his sweet, precious presence. He speaks peace through his precious word. He speaks peace and assures us of his peace. When we, he tells us of his promises, he says, Lo, I am with you, even to the end of the ages. May I read Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2? Beautiful verses. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, there they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burnt. The flames will not set you ablaze. Psalm 46 verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the, though the earth gives way, though the mountains fall into the midst of the sea, though the waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. John chapter 16 verse 33. These things I have told you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, but I have overcome the world. Dear friends, these are just a few examples of the precious word and his promises, which are so abundant in his word. And then Peter says, 1 Peter 5, 7, Cast your care upon him, for he cares for you. Cast your word. That word cast means throw away. Peter was a fisherman, you know. You know, they have the net, you know, which they cast into the sea to catch fishes. He says, cast your burdens. 
You know, I'm reminded of what a story. This is long, long ago when we didn't have the modern ways of communication and transport. In a small village, a farmer was taking his produce to the market in a bullock cart through a village road. And halfway through, he noticed a man. He was also carrying his produce in a gunny bag, a heavy gunny bag on his head. He was sweating and he was really tired. So this bullock cart man had some pity on him. He said, sir, why don't you come onto my bullock cart and sit there? So this poor farmer came and sat on the bullock cart. After a little while, the driver of the bullock cart turned back and saw this poor farmer is still carrying the heavy load of vegetables on his head. Give your burdens to him and don't take it back. But may I tell you more than anything else, which keeps us strong in our time of trouble and storm, is the love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. Peter says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And you are filled with inexpressible joy, glorious joy. You know, it is this deep, personal love and intimacy with the Savior that keeps us going. We sang that song, you know. I have a friend like Jesus. I have no other friend like Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Fairest of 10,000 to my soul. It's talking about my romance with the Lord Jesus. Are these just words? Were you singing from the depth of your soul? Please allow me to use this word. It's not a very good word. It's a word from romance. May I ask you, are you really infatuated with the love for your bridegroom? Like the Ephesian church, when the Lord tell you this morning, you have left, I have this one thing against you. That you have left your first love. It is this love that fills our hearts with inexpressible and glorious joy. And as I come to the close of my message, let me ask you, what has happened to you during COVID? Has COVID conquered you? Are you there in a spiritual lockdown? Let me tell you some of the things that the COVID, what the COVID means to me this morning. I will just, I won't go into the details, but I'll just mention some of the things briefly. First of all, I have come to realize the fragility of life. Life is fragile. The uncertainty of life. Then it reminds me of the preciousness of God's word. His promises in real time experience. Oh, how the Psalms <laughs> have ministered to me. When I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. In the sufficiency of his abundant grace, I have experienced it. And the Holy Spirit, who is the divine comforter, the paraclete, who has been sent by my side to be with me forever, he comforts me. 
and COVID has talked to me about the reality of life and the sweetness of heaven. You know, dear friends, especially the Caleb's, the worst thing that can happen to you at the moment is your death. <laughs> but prepare to meet your God. Then I was reminded of the urgency of the gospel, you know. You know, in the coming days, I believe, our traditional methods of evangelism may not work. But we have to show the, the world that we are the light and the salt. And Jesus said, through your love for one another, they will see that you are my disciples. Then, in the singularity of the faith, my God and I, I don't have any other fellowship. But I am locked up in my room, in my cell, in sweet fellowship with my Lord and I. And then he tells me that I need to, be, I need to get involved with others. All that I have, I can keep them to myself. My possessions, my bank balance, it's for the others. Be liberal, be gracious, give it out. Then it tells me that God is sovereign. I don't define God according to my experience. And coming back to the Caleb's, and dear young friends, may I want to thank you this morning. Children of the Caleb's, thank you so much for looking after us because the world has told you that we are the vulnerable ones. Thank you for the special care that you have taken for us. May the Lord bless you. I praise God for all our young men, our children, our sons and daughters and our grandchildren. Caleb's, are you tired of living? You know, there is a command which is oft repeated. I, I, I'm told that it is repeated 365 times in the scriptures. Fear not. Fear not. What are you afraid of today? I have a feeling that some of us, Caleb's and maybe others, are suffering under a nagging sense of fear. Fear of disease, fear of the future, fear of death. I feel that some of you are paralyzed with the fear of death. You can't afford to be a slave to fear. If you are a child of God, you will be with your savior when you die. And if you do not have that assurance this morning, please, please, may I plead with you before you go away from here, be reconciled with your God right now. The word of God says that perfect love cast away fear. Many of you need, need to come out of that, your lethargic state of mind. Come out from that easy chair. Lord, I pray deliverance for your people this morning. I rebuke that nagging spirit of fear. I speak deliverance. I release deliverance for your people and deliverance and freedom in the name of Jesus. Friends, don't be caught unprepared when death knocks at your door. Be ready to receive your king. And lastly, may I finish with this story. You might have heard about this. Footsteps in the foot, you know, footprints on the sand. This person says, I had a dream. I dreamed about my walk with the Lord on the beach. And at every face of my life, every scene, I could see two sets of footprints. But towards the end of my life, he says, I could see only two set, only one set of footprints. And he asked the Lord, Lord, what's happening? When I, am, I was passing through direst trouble and sadness in my life, there were only one step of, 
one set of footprints why did you leave me and the lord answered my child i will never leave you nor forsake you i will be with you till the end of your life the two one set of footprint that you saw on the sand when you passed through difficult times that was not yours they were my footprints i was carrying you in my arms may the lord bless you may the lord bless you enable you to come out victorious over this difficult time covid is not the end of life this through this too will pass may the lord bless you thank you for taking time to listen if you would like more information about our church or would like to make a comment please mail us at info at newlifeag.in. God bless you.